All right. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to our broadcast this evening. Uh, tonight we have uh, uh, Mark Thornton, who is a regular on our broadcast, and we know that uh, Mark is. Uh, been, we've been good friends for a long time. We go all the way back to grade school. And Mark has never been one to uh, uh, been afraid to take on topics and to do things that would be considered would not be considered by others as topics to do. So there are no sacred cows with Mark. He he takes on the topics no one else does. So um, tonight he's going to uh, talk about the lessons we can learn from. Uh, the events of the Korean War. From the Korean War POW experience. All right. Now, by the way, I've known Don since he was a substitute paper boy. <laughs> back in back in 1975, uh, I helped him that day. and It wasn't even your route, Don. Nope, it wasn't It was Lloyd route. Carter's route, and I took over that route in uh, late 76. But anyway. This topic, uh, it is a little unusual, and perhaps you're wondering, why should we care about this? This is the top, the name of the topic is Brainwashed by the Chai Coms, What We Can Learn from the Korean War POW Experience. Well, it is unusual, but just give me a chance on this, because there's a little more to this than you might think. This does involve psychology, it involves economics, because I'm going to be talking about what these men were being taught. <clears throat> And it does involve more history than it does theology, but just remember that the Bible is mostly history. It's not just a set of laws. Now, why is that? Now, part of the answer is in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. Now, these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. That was Paul writing about Israel in the wilderness. Jude 7 says pretty much the same kind of thing. And he was, well, Jude was referring to Sodom and Gomorrah. But now there's a lot of historical examples in the Bible. And those who do not learn from the past are what? Doomed to repeat it. It was George Santayana that said that a long time ago. Santayana was a history professor at Harvard. He died in 1952 at the age of 88. And yes, that statement is true. You don't understand the past, you're not going to understand the present, you're not going to be able to anticipate the future. There's a lot we can learn from the past. There's, the, But there is also a very strong theological element to this, which I'm going to be pointing out. Now, like I said, these men were being taught about economics, and the Bible does have a lot to say about economics. I'm going to be talking about that, too. There's really three parts to this. Now... The Korean War POWs, when they came back, they came back with a very dark cloud hanging over their heads. They were under a very dark cloud of suspicion and they were accused of being traitors. They were accused of being communists and they were accused of being weak-minded people. They actually were no more weak-minded than the average person. But these men uh, were judged pretty harshly. And in fact, I think they were victims of the Red Scare, which was in full swing at that time. Now, there were in a series of, uh, I mean, a lot of, well, well, the fact of the matter is, even though these men were actually hardened combat veterans, the Chinese, who were their captors at the time, were waging a psychological war against these men, which they were simply not prepared for, and the Chinese managed to turn these guys into a bunch of meat puppets. They managed to extract a lot of propaganda statements out of these men, which were written and recorded. They were aired on Radio Beijing, a shortwave station that was heard by our troops in the field was also heard by both Army and Navy intelligence at the time, and they recorded these things, and they used these recordings as <clears throat> evidence against these men, some of whom were put on trial, quite a few. Now, a typical statement went as follows. Join us as guests of the Chinese People's Volunteer Army. Don't go on with this senseless war. Stop being tools of the rich capitalists who start wars for profit. 
No, other statements uh, said that they, that they were being well treated, which was not true at all. Other statements would say that the U.S. 7th Fleet should withdraw from the South China, from the, uh, from the Sea of Japan and the Yellow Sea, which surrounded the Korean Peninsula. And these things were being scripted by people that did not speak English as their first language. That was obvious. Now, you could say that you could force people to say and do things, but you can't force people to believe things. And yes, that's true, but you can fool people into believing things. You can trick them in various ways. Now, let's look at Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, he, he has indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat every, every eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, the fruit of the tree which was in the midst of the garden. God said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Well, you know the rest of the story. He tricked her. He did not threaten her. Did not force her to do anything, he fooled her. Now, this was, uh, Chinese were actually using similar tactics against our men. And these are things that we could learn from. They did not use a lot of physical violence. They did use some violence. And they did use various forms of various threats and intimidation, which were effective to a point. But they mostly used subtlety and trickery. Now, like I said, when these men came back, they were accused of various things. And there were a new there were a series of articles written about these men in various magazines and newspapers. There were books written about them, and they were these men were portrayed very, very, very negatively. They were portrayed as having very deep character flaws. They were portrayed as lacking moral fiber. They were portrayed as cowards. And there were two basic explanations for this that were being given over and over. And the first one was that these men were coddled and pampered by their mothers when they were children. That was not true at all. The second explanation was that they, had, they were poorly educated. And that was the reason for what was happening. Well, there is a certain amount of truth to that. But uh, the Chinese had allowed me to uh, explain this because the Chinese had divided these men into two basic categories, the progressives and the reactionaries. The progressives were going along with the indoctrination program, which was later, later became known as brainwashing. The first time the word brainwashing was ever used was in 1951. It was in a New York Times article. It was used to describe what was happening to our troops in Korea, the POWs. Now, supposedly, according to these articles, the people that were going along with the brainwashing were the progressives and they were not well educated. And that was part of the problem. They tried to make a psychological profile of these people, try to figure out what was happening. Then you had the re reactionaries, and supposedly the reactionaries were more intelligent, more educated. That actually was not true at all. In fact, the guys that were labeled as reactionaries were oftentimes just too stupid to understand what the Chinese were trying to teach them. They were not more educated. They were not more intelligent than the so-called progressive. <clears throat> that was another myth. However, Education was a problem with these men because most of them did not finish high school. They did not know much about American government. They did not know much about economics. And the Chinese were working basically with a clean slate with a lot of these guys. And that was a problem. So I want to make that clear. Now, when these men were first repaid, well, here's another problem here, is that these men were being intensely indoctrinated into a, an, a, an ideology that was completely anathema, anathema to them, and that was the communist ideology. They were being subjected to this 10 to 12 hours a day, seven days a week. It was very intensive. <clears throat> 
and uh, it was later called brainwash. Now, they were not very successful in indoctrinating these people into this. They were, had limited success with it. However, they, like I said, they were successful at extracting propaganda statements from these men, and they were also very successful at turning these men against one another. That's another aspect of this whole story that I think we can learn from. Which is, I'm telling you, their tactics were straight out of Satan's playbook. They deliberately created an atmosphere of suspicion and mistrust among these men. <clears throat> now, when they first got there, the Chinese told these men that everybody's the same here. There's no more rank. Well, they broke down the chain of command and the discipline went with it. They told the, they separated the officers from the enlisted men. They separated the black guys from the white guys. They separated the British guys from the Americans. They said everybody's the same, and then they divided people into categories. They didn't treat everybody the same. You know, they had specific people, specific categories of people that they were going to target. They specifically targeted unmarried men who would, did not have strong family ties. They specifically targeted people that did not have strong religious beliefs. And they had a psychological profile that they already had worked out, which I'm going to get to later. And it was actually pretty accurate. <clears throat> but they basically, they broke down the morale. And uh, these men did not trust one another. They hardly spoke to one another. They did not have a lot of camaraderie. That's another important aspect of this whole story. Now, <clears throat> When these men were first repatriated, after the war, they were taken to the Tokyo General Hospital and they were nursed back to health. They were in poor physical condition, they were malnourished and they had not received any medical care. But it became apparent early on that there was something psychologically wrong with these men because they were basically a bunch of zombies. They did not express emotion, they hardly spoke at all. And then <clears throat> they were all told that they could make a phone call back home. Now you think they would jump at the chance to make a phone call. They were told call anybody you want, no charge. They all said the same thing. No, they did not want to talk to anybody. Nobody made a phone call. It didn't make any sense. The doctors couldn't believe it. Then they were all told that you could have a three-day pass or four-day pass and go and see Tokyo. And they were offered money. Once again, these guys all have said the same thing. No, they didn't go. They didn't. Nobody left the hospital. They didn't want to see anybody. They didn't want to talk to anybody. They didn't want to go anywhere. It didn't seem to make sense. Then, when they were taken back home, they were not flown back. They were taken back on board a large cargo ship. And it was done deliberately because that's when the counterintelligence corps conducted their investigation. Now the military was absolutely horrified by the propaganda statements that were made by our troops. They were horrified by the extraordinarily unprecedented high attrition rate among these men. Now I read widely varying numbers on this between 38 and 58%. Now, there were 7,148 men that were actually taken to POW camps in Korea. A little over 3,700 came back. But that number of 7,148 only includes the men that actually made it to the camps. When these men were captured, they were taken on these long, protracted death marches to the camps, which were along the Yellow River. Most of them did not make it there especially the ones that were captured early on, especially the ones captured by the North Koreans because a lot of those guys, most of them were actually massacred after they were captured. <clears throat> the number, the real number of attrition was more like 58%, which has never happened before, at least not since the Revolutionary War. In the, in the Second World War, 
Americans that were taken prisoner by the Germans only had a 4% attrition rate, which is actually a natural death rate. The ones that were taken captive by the Japanese had about a 34% rate. But uh, our guys apparently had about a 58% attrition rate. They were, they were taken by the North Koreans and the Chinese in Korea. Not only that, the military was horrified by the fact that nobody ever escaped from a Korean War POW camp in spite of the fact that there were no fences and no guard towers around these camps and, the, and very few of the guards even carried weapons. There were some guys that apparently did escape on the way to the camps, but nobody actually escaped from a camp. Then, there was another big debacle, another embarrassment, where 21 Americans, POWs, refused repatriation and they stayed in China after the war. There was also a British Royal Marine named Andrew Condren. He also stayed in China after the war. It was a huge propaganda coup for the Chinese. Eventually, all the two of them came back. But that's another bizarre chapter to this whole story. Well, they launched an investigation into this. They wanted answers. They wanted to know what happened to these men. And they began this investigation shortly after these men started coming back. <clears throat> but they waited until they were on that ship on their way from Tokyo to San Francisco. That ship took 17 days to cross the Pacific. And that's when the counterintelligence corps conducted their investigation. Now they were given a long list of questions to ask these men. <clears throat> I'm not going to read all of them, but the first eight of them got right to the point. How were the POW and squad leaders chosen in Camp 5? Did any POWs take role of prisoners? Name POWs who, preferred, who performed special jobs, held offices, or served as liaison representatives, or were speakers. Name POWs who attempted to influence other prisoners to follow and accept theories of a foreign ideology, particularly communism. Name POWs who took walks with camp officials, cultivated friendship with Chinese or North Koreans, reported to camp officials outside the camp, lived outside the POW compound, were away from the camp for extended periods of time, or were sent outside North Korea. Or attempted to interfere with the efforts of others to escape. Name POWs who spoke a foreign language or learned Chinese or Korean while, while prisoners. Name prisoners who circulated petitions or made recordings for the camp authorities. Well, these questions and many others were asked of these men while they were on board that ship coming back. And what, what book are you reading from? This is a book for, called I Cannot Forget story of the late Johnny Moore. I'm going to be talking more about that. Now, it's, this, this book came out in 2012. It's a very sad story. It's a bizarre story. Well, a lot of these guys were not very <clears throat> cooperative. They didn't want to talk, but some of them did. And pretty soon the fingers started pointing. And pretty soon fights started breaking out among these men on that ship. Some of them had to be kept in protective custody because other prisoners were trying to kill them. And one of them was the late Johnny Moore, who I'm gonna be talking about later in this book. This is the book uh, I cannot forget. It's about Johnny Moore. And he was accused of being a collaborator in the war. And it's a very, very sad story. So now what happened to these men? Why did they behave the way that they did? And what can we learn from this? Now, before I get to that, I want to backtrack and I want to, I want to set the scene and I want to do a brief history of the Korean War and I want to play some sound bites from the early 50s and talk about them and then I want to do a brief slideshow. So, but first we have a word from our sponsor. Mm -hmm. And, oh yes. 21, is it? 21, yeah, we find it for free. Bear with me here. I got CD player decided it's not going to cooperate. Was it 20? Yeah, 21. We got to share first. 
Got to share it. Okay, media player. Share sound. All right. Setting the stage for the time period. Cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Tens of thousands of doctors in all branches of medicine in all parts of the country were asked that question. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was Camel. Yes, surveys show more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Smoke Camels, the cigarette so many doctors enjoy. Okay, what else? There for the next one? Or? Yeah. Okay, we'll just play these then. These tanks, playing on the superstitious nature of the enemy, are painted with the markings of the tiger. Intensified armor supported attacks of this kind are rolling back the red aggressors along most of the front and are preventing them from initiating any offensive action of their own. Assault troops advance to the objective through dense underbrush, where the Reds still hold out despite the heavy artillery pounding. The attack moves to the crest of the hill, and grenades are used to blast the remaining defenders from their deep holes and caves, which enable them to weather the pre-attack pounding. As our advance forces secure the heights, reserve units entrench themselves in the valley to consolidate the gains. Three midweek Chinese counterattacks are turned back by the 24th Division here in the area of the Pukan River as the Reds attempt to outflank the 25th Division salient to the west. All right, let's pause it for a second. I believe that we must try to limit. All right, first of all, the camel ad was from 1949. And I was just trying to give you a feel for the time period. Okay. The second one it's from April 1951, which is from a newsreel. There was actually no television coverage at all of the Korean War. But they did have newsreels at the time, and that was from a newsreel. They were trying to put, put, put a rosy picture on the situation. Actually, things have been going very, very badly for more than five months before that. Now, I forgot to mention. I, well, I first spoke in this at Geiger's over three years ago, and I, I said, I asked everyone, when did the war start? When did it end? Nobody knew. It started June 25th, 1950. And it ended July 27th, 1953. It was three years, one month, and two days. And it's known as the Forgotten War. There was actually very little media coverage at the time of it. And this is only this, the war started just five years after World War II. And by comparison, I mean, it just didn't seem like a big deal. World War II was the worst war of all time. And Korea just didn't seem like a, a serious matter. In fact, the world was teetering on the brink of World War III. Most of the people that fought in that war were not Koreans. None of the weapons that were used in that war were made in Korea. And uh, there were actually 16 UN member nations that fought in Korea. Almost all the fighting was actually done by Americans and South Koreans. Now the grand total was, well, there were 36,940 Americans KIA I don't know how many South Koreans there were. There were another 18,000 or so other UN forces killed. The second highest casualty total was taken by the British who lost a whopping 1,078. <clears throat> the third highest total was by the Turks who lost less than 800 men. However, well, let's go to the next sound bite. I believe that we must try to limit the war to Korea for these vital reasons, to make sure that the precious lives of our fighting men are not wasted, to see that the security of our country and the free world is not needlessly jeopardized, and to prevent a third world war. A number of events have made it evident that General MacArthur did not agree with that policy. I have therefore considered it essential to relieve General MacArthur so that there would be no doubt or confusion as to the real purpose and aim of our policy. It was with the deepest personal regret 
that I found myself compelled to take this action. General MacArthur is one of our greatest military commanders. But the cause of world peace is much more important than any individual. All right, that was April 11th, 1951. President Harry Truman fired General Douglas MacArthur, who was in charge of our forces at that time. It was a very, very controversial decision. Douglas MacArthur, by the way, was far more popular than Harry Truman was. Truman was never very popular. Now, the fact of the matter is that Douglas MacArthur was openly defying Harry Truman and his policies at that time, and the president is commander-in-chief. So now you could say that, he, that Truman, okay, I think that Truman kind of bungled that war. I think he should have been uh, probably more, uh, should probably listen to Douglas MacArthur more than he did. However, MacArthur was kind of insubordinate, and that's what led to this. But it was a very controversial decision. A lot of people were very upset about it. And things had been going very badly in the war at that time. It wasn't all MacArthur's fault. He took the blame for a lot of that. All right, now let's go to the next one. We have had our last If we will not devise some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be at our door. The problem basically is theological and involves a spiritual recrudescent and improvement of human character that will synchronize with our almost matchless advances in science, art, literature, and all material and cultural developments of the past 2,000 years. It must be of the spirit if we are to save the play. All right, let's stop that one for a minute. That was MacArthur's farewell address before the uh, Combined Houses of Congress, April 19th, 1951. Eight days later, he came to Milwaukee, which is where he had spent some time in his youth, as where his parents were living when he was, when he was growing up. And uh, about a million people turned out for it. He did a huge procession for him. I have pictures of it. It's, it was a big deal. He was a very, very popular guy. All right, now let's do the next one. Ladies and gentlemen, a good evening to you. Four times today, Adams Prize, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg appealed their sentence of death, and four times they were unsuccessful. They will be executed tonight, probably within the next half hour, the first husband and wife to die in the electric chair. Inside the stone walls of Sing Sing Prison, the Rosenbergs wait all day for word of their fate. It's now more than two years since they were first sentenced to die for organizing atomic espionage for Russia. Rabbi Irving Kozlo, a prison chaplain, goes in. He will not leave until after the execution, which is being held before sundown because the setting of the sun this Friday marks the beginning of the Holy Sabbath in the Jewish calendar. All right. Uh, we're up to June 19th, 1953. The Rosenbergs we got the hot seat in New York. Uh, they were guilty as charged, but there, there were much bigger fish that got away. And that was another controversial issue. I'm just trying to give you a feel for the time period. It's not directly about Korea. But uh, let's do the McCarthy. Uh, so oh, yeah, it's our that? favorite little senator. Right. <laughs> the pride of Appleton, the Wisconsin. pride of Appleton, Wisconsin. Right, yes. here we go. Let's play this one. One communist on the faculty. Of one university is one communist too many. One communist among the American advisors at Yalta was one communist too many. And even, even if there were only one communist in the State Department, even if there are only one communist in the State Department, that would still be one communist, too many. All right, that was uh, tail gunner Joe McCarthy, the pride of Appleton, Wisconsin. He was a senator elected in 1946. He uh, replaced uh, 
Bob LaFollette Jr., his predecessor, a fellow Republican, uh, McCarthy, uh, kind of waged a smear campaign against uh, LaFollette. And in fact, he drove Bob LaFollette to suicide in 19, February 4th, 1953. LaFollette had been uh, the head of a committee on, on civil liberties in the Senate. And it turned out two of the people that worked for him on that committee were communists. McCarthy was about to expose him. Maca uh, at that time, LaFollette was an advisor on foreign aid to Harry Truman. And uh, LaFollette blew his brains out February 4th, 1953 in his office in Washington, D.C. McCarthy was kind of a nasty guy. Also, here's another thing about McCarthy is that uh, one of the reasons why the former POWs from Korea was judged so harshly was because of the Army McCarthy hearings, that were, which were going on through almost all of 1954. McCarthy had been accusing the Army of harboring communists. And these hearings were televised nationally. They were also shown in theaters because not everybody had a TV, but they were seen by over 20 million people. But it turned out to be his undoing. He made a lot of accusations. He never proved anything. And finally, the Senate censured him on December 4th, 1954. <clears throat> they basically shut him down. And he was kind of a destructive guy. The, the, he never produced any real evidence that the army was harboring communists, but this is one of the reasons why former POWs from Korea were being put on trial after the war. This was going on at the very same time. So let's do the next clip. What have we got next? What was that? It was 29, I believe. All uh, right. Let's do, uh, that was 20. No. No, no, that was a different one. We didn't do 29 yet, did we? No, we haven't. All right, do 29. What was that one? Operation Big Switch begins to have tangible results on the home front as an able transport bearing. Sorry, I got out of order. Sorry about that. My fault. All right, here we go. I am Clown Cecil Adams of Memphis, Tennessee. My family and millions of other Negroes, plus myself, have suffered under the brutal attack of white supremacy and the cruel slave laws of the southern states. These are the reasons why I can't be living happily with my family. All right. That was Clarence Cecil. Wait, let's stop that. That was Clarence Cecil Adams. He was a POW in Camp 5, and he was one of the 21 Americans who stayed behind in China and refused repatriation. There were three black guys that refused to come back. William White was one of them. Now, the story of Clarence Adams is one of the most bizarre stories I've ever read outside of the Bible. I read a book about him. I think it came out in 2006. Clarence died in 1999 at the age of 70. Well, he, he, he stayed in China. He learned Chinese, married a Chinese woman, had a couple of kids, got a bachelor's degree in Chinese literature from a, a Chinese university in the Wu-Tang province. He finally came back in 1966 when the Chinese were going through the Cultural Revolution. And he was harassed uh, the whole time by the FBI. His mom was being harassed by the FBI the whole time that he was still in China. Now here's another thing. Is that uh, almost all the guys, almost all the POWs, that were held captive in Korea were being monitored by the FBI for at least three years after they came back, almost all of them. Some of them were being followed and being openly harassed by FBI agents that would confront them. There was one man, uh, a story that I read from his own account, his name was James Dick. He was an army sergeant and uh, the army wanted him to testify against another prisoner that was Claude Batchelor and he refused to testify and there were two FBI agents from Cincinnati that followed him around and harassed him. They were confronted when he worked at a steel mill in Ohio, would accuse him of being a communist, accuse him of being a traitor and all kinds of crazy things that I can't even tell you. <clears throat> but this is what was going on at that time. These men were under a cloud of suspicion. They thought they didn't, they were not being trusted by anybody. 
even the guys, and then of course the guys that uh, they had had reenlisted, a lot of them went on trial and were court-martialed. But, the, but about, there were a lot of guys that they wanted to put on trial, but they didn't reenlist, so they couldn't court-martial them, but they followed them around and harassed them. <clears throat> and that was certainly the case with the guys, uh, there were 21 Americans that stayed behind in China. There was one British Royal Marine, Andrew Condren. All but two of them ended up coming back eventually. James Veneris never came back. There was one of them that died over there. Uh, but uh, all of them ended up coming back. And when they came back, they got in, they were in trouble. They had, they had a very hard time finding employment and they were being harassed by the FBI. All right, now let's do the, the last one. This is from September, 1953, when these guys were first coming back. Okay, this is 29. Right. Okay, so we're not gonna do 33. No, we don't have to do that. Okay. Operation Big Switch begins to have tangible results on the home front as a naval transport bearing 411 Korean prisoners of war docks at San Francisco amid scenes of emotion. Next ashore is Sergeant Harry Borey of Philadelphia, who is greeted by Generals Lewis and Glasgow. The joy of reunion dominates the whole pier as fathers, mothers, and wives embrace men, some of whom had been given up for lost. For the returning soldiers, it is the end of a long, dark night of suffering and loneliness. For the scores of relatives, it is the end of a nightmare of waiting and uncertainty. It is the answer to their prayers. Our boy is home again. All right, now let's do the slideshow. That was from September 53 when these guys first came back. I gotta share this. Stop share. Okay, you want to elaborate on these pictures? All right, uh, these are on the screen. Then. Right here. Well, okay, here's a, a scene from Korea. The flamethrower was heavily used in Korea. And here's one of these scenes. By the way, the flamethrower was later banned from the American arsenal by President Jimmy Carter in 1977, and rightly so. It's a very, very nasty weapon. It was first used by the Germans in the First World War. Let's do the next one. All right, these are the, some of the bodies from late 1950, early 51. No, wait, we're going to shrink that one down. Now, uh, the winter of 1950-51 was the worst winter on record in Korea. Temperatures may have dipped down below as much as 50 degrees below zero. And, it, and uh, a lot of men froze to death. And I remember last January 31st, we got down to 23 below with a 55 below wind chill. And I was ready to die. And I don't know how, these, how anybody could survive that kind of thing, but these guys were trying to survive outside. A lot of them froze. The ones that survived ended up with frostbite. Now there's some British Royal Marines in this picture. This is late 50 or early 51. Let's do the next picture. Okay, let's, no, let's just skip this new one. All right, these are Marines on their way north. This is late 1950. Now what happened after this was actually the worst military defeat in American history. That was the Battle of Chosin Reservoir. And hardly anybody knows about this because what happened, uh, the, uh, they, they were going up north. They were in sight of the Yellow River. Some units had made it all the way to the Yellow River, which is the Chinese border. And things have been going pretty well up until that time. But Thanksgiving was November 25th. And these guys had a Thanksgiving turkey dinner flown into them with helicopters. And these guys were celebrating what they thought was mission accomplished. But that night, there was a stunning turn of events. And you know what that was. The Chinese decided to enter the war. They sent some between three and 400,000 uh, troops across the Yellow River, which had frozen over by that time. MacArthur had thought the river would be a barrier, but it wasn't because that early winter that year, and the Chinese were able to walk across it. They completely overwhelmed their forces. And the 1st Marine Division was nearly wiped out. The 2nd Infantry Division lost half of its men in about a month. And it was actually the worst military defeat in American history against a foreign enemy, but hardly anybody knows about this. <clears throat> and what, and uh, what happened was, 
our forces were driven down almost the entire length of the Korean Peninsula, right, right back down to the Pusan perimeter at the southern tip of the peninsula. And it took about five months for them to fight their way back to the, back to the middle of the peninsula. Now, the, most of the fighting was in the first year of the war. The first year was complete mayhem. Now, these guys were Marines. They were still on their way north. They were still pretty optimistic. Now, let's go to the next one. All right, the Chinese were known for the so-called human wave attack. They, they were very poorly equipped, but what they lacked in, in firepower, they tried to make up for it with sheer numbers, and they, they vastly outnumbered our, our forces. And oftentimes, our guys just did not have enough ammunition to kill them all. <clears throat> the frontline troops that the Chinese had either had hand grenades or Molotov cocktails. That's how poorly equipped they were. Most of these guys did not even carry a rifle. And they knew they were going to take a lot of casualties. And they took, I mean, like I said, the Chinese lost about a million men. The North Koreans lost about a million men compared to 34,000 of our guys. So it's the most lopsided kill ratio I've ever heard of. Now, this was a scene after one small battle. But this is just a tiny sampling. I, I took a whole class on the Korean War in college. And this was in the textbook for that class. Now, let's do the next uh, scene here. Uh, these were just some nurses uh, from a mass unit taking a break here. Uh, let's move forward. All right, now these, this is a, a rare photo of American POWs shortly after they were captured. This is late 1950. <clears throat> uh, let's go to the next picture. All right, here's another shot of a flamethrower. And then... Uh, Okay, these, these guys apparently, I don't know if they were moving north or south at this time. I think they were still moving north. But Chosin Reservoir was in a mountainous area. There was only one road leading out. The Chinese had surrounded it and they pulverized it. And it was a real bottleneck. They couldn't get through it. <clears throat> they were simply trapped. All right, so let's go to the next one. These were, these were Americans. That were, this was early on in the war. These were American POWs that were massacred by the North Koreans. Uh, these guys had, uh, had their hands tied behind their back. And uh, by the way, the North Koreans are the worst people in the whole world. They had no regard for human life at all. Move forward. All right, here's some more frozen bodies. This is from late, uh, late 50 or early 51. All right. Next picture. This is a mash unit. And uh, by the way, these guys had short hair. It wasn't like the TV show where everybody had a 70s haircut and there was no laugh track involved in this. But this is how it really looked. All right, let's go to the next one. This was, these were Americans that were massacred by the North Koreans. Notice they all had their hands tied behind their back. This is from early, this is from the summer of 1950. All right, next one. All right, this is another mass unit. This is from 1951. Uh, notice the word, they had a couple of black nurses in this picture. Uh, that Harry Truman had desegregated the military in 1948, and that was the first war where they, were, they had <clears throat> integrated units. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, this was the last battle of the Korean War, Port Chop Hill. There were actually two stages to this battle. April, it was originally held by Americans. It was uh, overrun by the Chinese in April 1953. They launched a human wave attack and it was a slaughter, but then it was retaken by Americans in July of 1953. This was taken in July. Let's do the next picture. This was the aftermath of that battle. I don't know how those guys made it up that slope, but they did, they managed to retake that hill from the Chai Coms. And then the war ended just days after that battle. So that's the last picture from that war. Now, let's get back to what happened to the POW. Now, the Chinese had a profile of what Americans were. But first, I want to read a, a, a dictionary definition of what exactly is brainwashing. Now, that's a subjective term. It can mean different things to different people. Oh, wait a minute. Let's go to, uh, what was the next picture? The one of the, uh, first, wait, I want to read uh, the list of the guys who were court-martialed. Let's do that okay, one. Let's, 
That would be Silvis? No. No. There. All right, okay. All right, good. Hang on, I gotta share this. Oops. Gotta clean that one up because I had a problem. Yes, my yeah. Bear with me, people. This is Ah! Come on. All right, let me share this here. Come on. Share. And we're gonna share this. All right, now this is a list of men that were court-martialed after the war. Uh, two of them were charged with homicide. The rest of them were charged with Articles 104 and 105 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Article 104 is aiding the enemy in communication with the enemy. Article 105 is conduct undermining good order or military discipline or bringing discredit to the U.S. Armed Forces. Now, under these standards, they could have brought, they basically could have busted everybody for these things. All these guys signed things and you had to. You complied or you died. Now, like I said, I think these men were judged harshly and it's easy to play armchair quarterback and say that you would have handled it differently. And every guy thinks that they're tough, but people aren't quite as tough as they like to think that they are. <clears throat> now, I want to read through this list. Private Roth Rothwell Floyd, court martial February 1954, sentenced to 40 years, later reduced to 10 years. He was not charged with Articles 104 and 105. He was charged with double homicide. He was acquitted of that, but he was convicted of larceny and striking a superior officer. He was a really bad guy. I've read about all, I've studied all these cases. And this guy was the worst guy on the list. The first three guys in this list were guilty. Now I'll get the Corporal Edward Dickinson, court martial February or April 4th, 1954. Sentenced to 10 years, later reduced to five years, released April, uh, November 23rd, 1957, served three and a half years. He was in Camp 3, or Camp 5. Then we have Corporal Claude Batchelor, court martial uh, September 30th, 1954. Sentenced to life. Later reduced to 20 years, but he was released without any explanation on March 18th, 1959. He had served four and a half years. He was kind of the most extreme case of all. I'm going to be talking a little more, more about him later. Then he had Colonel Harry Fleming from Free Scene, Wisconsin, court martial November 1954. Did not go to prison, but he received a dishonorable discharge. In his case, I don't think that he really should have been court martialed. The rest of these guys were, were judged pretty harshly. And you had Major Ambrose Nugent from Merrill, Wisconsin. He was acquitted January 1955. He was taken prisoner right at the beginning of the war. He was forced to sign a blank sheet of paper when the Chinese and the, the North Koreans did the rest. They added in it. They made it into a propaganda statement once they dropped from airplanes over at troops. Now, there was a movie from 1957 called Time Limit with Richard Basehart, and I think was based on this case because what Ambrose Nugent was told, well, first it was, he was taken on a long death march where almost all the people that were with him died on the way there. 74 men made it back, to, made it to, the, to a camp. And Ambrose Nugent was told that if he didn't sign a piece of paper that the North Koreans were going to kill everybody there, all 74 men. <clears throat> which they would have, and he knew that. So he signed a piece of paper. And uh, and he got in trouble for that. He was, however, acquitted. Then he had Master Sergeant William Olson, court martial January 1955, sentenced to two years, released January 19th, 1957, died in 1959. William Olson was a charge of indoctrinating the new, the new prisoners, and he wore a, actually wore a Chinese Army uniform, complete with the red star on a Chinese Army hat. He had won the Silver Star in World War II. It's kind of a weird case. <clears throat> then he had Corporal Harold Dunn, court-martialed June, uh, June 29, 1955. Sentenced to eight years, later reduced to two, released Jan July 1, 1957. Then he had Sergeant John Tyler, who was acquitted on, in July 1955. Sergeant James Gallagher, court-martialed August 1955, sentenced to, to life, released 
1966. He was convicted of double homicide. Then he had Lieutenant Jeff Irwin acquitted August 1955. Corporal Thomas Bays court martialed September 2nd, 1955. Sentenced to 15 years, reduced to two and a half. Released September 14th, 1957. Then you had Major Ron Alley, court martial November 1955, sentenced to 10 years. He served five years. Major Ron Alley lost his mind in prison. He was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic before he was finally released. Quite sad. Then you had Lieutenant Colonel Paul Lyles, court martial November 1955, reprimanded and suspended two years. Paul Lyles was actually a West Point graduate. And when he was, uh, when he was court-martialed, uh, it was uh, Senator Hubert Humphrey from Minnesota wrote a letter to the Army Chief of Staff saying that Lyles got off way too easy. He thought Lyles should have gotten a much tougher sentence. Then he had Sergeant William Banghart court-martialed, sentenced to 15 years, later reduced to two years. Then you had Colonel Frank Schwab of USMC. He was, uh, he was cleared by a field board of inquiry, acquitted in 1955. He had confessed to waging germ warfare. He had been a pilot. Now, here's another thing. All the guys that went on trial were Army. The Air Force did not put anybody on trial in spite of the fact that many of these guys, many of these pilots, claimed that we were waging germ warfare in Korea. Now, the Air Force <clears throat> claimed they did not put these guys on trial because they had classified information, which is very disturbing. It makes me very suspicious, and I suspect that maybe we might have been waging germ warfare there because I could tell you that we did have biological weapons in our arsenal going way back to 1942. I hope that we weren't using those things, but it's possible that we were, but the fact that the Air Force did not court-martial anybody I think is very suspicious. <clears throat> Now, let's go to the next uh, uh, clip, which, which was uh, Johnny Moore. Uh, let's enlarge that one, Johnny. Yeah, I got, first I gotta share it too. All right. All right, here we go. Johnny Moore was cleared by a field board of inquiry, but he was charged with articles 104 and 105. He was, uh, Arrested in the middle of the night, July 29th, 1955. And he was thrown in jail. <clears throat> and the army had been basically jerking him around for years. <clears throat> Johnny, by that was his wife and his kid. Uh, Johnny married a 15-year-old girl in Texas in 1954. But uh, Johnny basically... Uh, <clears throat> Well, he, uh, he was thrown in jail. He was cleared, finally. But he ended up in a, he lost his mind. He ended up in a civilian prison, and it's a pretty sad story. And like I said, there were others that were being harassed by the FBI. Now, in Johnny's case, they wanted him to testify, that he did testify against Edward Dickinson. They wanted him to testify against Claude Batchelor. He got cold feet. He didn't want to do it. But now he had some interesting things to say about Claude Batchelor. This is in, uh, in the book, I Cannot Forget. He came to a group of us one day in January or February 1951 when everyone was freezing to death and starving and diseases were rampant and there was no medical treatment, no proper food of any kind, no clothing. It was the worst conditions that probably anybody had ever been in. And he came to a group of us and he said, I'm gonna do something here shortly that certainly may, may, may not be approved by any of you. I'm gonna tell you once, and then I'm never gonna tell you and repeat it to you again because I won't be able to. I'm gonna start buttering up the Chinese. And when I'm gonna try to get into the good graces and I'm gonna try to get us medicine and better food and clothing. People are going to accuse me of being a rat because I'm definitely going to have to show some friendship to them so I can get what we need. And we all said, do what you can. We're with you. I thought Bachelor was doing a good thing because I truly believed that what, what we were doing was not, 
<clears throat> believed that we were not going to live much longer if things continued that way. People were dying off at a furious rate in, the, in that first winter. I was a Sith the platoon leader at the time, so I knew what it was to be falsely accused of doing things that you're not doing. You just have to ignore them and go on and do what you think is the right thing to do. And so he did. And that's probably why I justified a lot of things that I saw him do and what I had heard he had done because I knew he was playing a game. I knew what the game was and I knew we couldn't talk about it. Turned out he didn't just play a game, he got totally involved. Well, that actually was supposedly the most extreme case of brainwashing. And Johnny didn't really want to testify against him. And uh, John, James Dick didn't want to testify against him either. But he ended up with a life sentence. So it was pretty tough. Now, what you had here was a situation where people were just trying to stay alive. Now, it's a tough spot to be in, and I don't want to, I don't want to play an armchair quarterback and say I would have handled things differently. And like I said, every guy thinks they're tough. But we've never been in this kind of situation. <clears throat> now, I want to get back to what was happening to these men. And I want to explain what exactly is brainwashing and what was happening to them. Now here's, a, here's the Random House Collegiate Dictionary definition. Brainwashing is a method of systematically changing attitudes or altering beliefs, especially through the use of torture, drugs, or psychological stress techniques, or any method of controlled systematic indoctrination. And that's what these men were going through. These were, these, this is when the term brainwashing originated. Now there's another <clears throat> aspect to this because like I said, they initially told everybody that, well, there's no more rank here and everybody's the same. Well, then they went, then they went ahead and divided everybody into categories, racial categories and uh, nationalities. They divided people according, they separated the officers from the enlisted men, black guys from the white guys, the British guys from the Americans. And they turned everybody against one another. They turned the black guys against the white guys. They turned the enlisted men against the officers. And they're very good at that. Not only that, they had certain, a certain psychological profile that they thought that they could use to their advantage. They said, according to their own literature, that the average American cannot think for himself, that he lacks self-confidence and lacks concern for others and has no standard of right and wrong and is basically an opportunist. And they thought they could take advantage of these weaknesses. Well, sure enough. That profile is pretty accurate. Now you could say that it doesn't just apply to Americans. You can apply that to pretty much anybody. But unfortunately, that is pretty much how it is. These men did not really think for themselves. And they were, they were but remember that they were at the complete mercy of the captors and any prisoner of war is not in, char not in control of their own situation. So it's difficult to really understand what these men were going through. But now here's another aspect of brainwashing that is not part of the definition that is an important part of what happened to these men. And that is the complete control of the information that they were getting. <clears throat> they were only being given one point of view continuously, all day, every day. And they did not tolerate dissenting points of view. Anybody with a dissenting point of view was separated from the group and they were, they were humiliated. They were ashamed. They were told there was something wrong with them. They were taken away. They were usually never seen from or heard from again. Now, one of the reasons why I think we can learn from this is because there are nations, governments, and churches that use some of these same tactics. They want to control all the information that you have and they squelch any alternative point of view. They will humiliate people with alternative points of view. Now, here's another thing. Now, the Chinese did not have enough people that spoke English that they could teach all these men. So they had to appoint other Americans to do this. And they had literature that they had to read from. Now, these men had no choice but to do this. 
Like I said, there were a bunch of meat puppets that were in the mercy of their captors. <clears throat> and if you <clears throat> differ from these, this point of view, you would be punished. Food would be withheld, withheld from you. And these guys were disappearing left and right. And these men were living in constant fear. Now, this kind of reminds me of what was going on, let's say, in Nazi Germany, where they tried to have total control of the information that people had. They had total control over the mass media. They controlled the newspapers, the magazines. They even controlled the entertainment business, especially the, the, the movies. And they especially wanted to control the radio. But as you know, in Europe, there's a lot of different countries, and you can get uh, radio broadcasts from other countries. Well, the Germans made radios that could not receive broadcasts from other countries. They could only receive broadcasts from Germany. And it was highly illegal to listen to broadcasts from foreign countries, <clears throat> especially the BBC over in Britain. And if you got busted for that, you would, be dis you would disappear. People would report you for it. It was highly, highly illegal. They wanted to control the information that you had. And another aspect to this was the Hitler youth camps, which is another form of brainwashing. They were trying to minimize parental influence. They were trying to replace parents with the government. They were trying to control all the influence and all the information that these kids had. And they specifically were targeting people that were easily influenced. In their cases, it was young people. Now, in the case of the American POWs, like I said, they were targeting unmarried men, people with, without strong family ties, and people without strong religious beliefs. Say, hey, who else targets people like that? How about Satan? Their, their tactics were straight out of Satan's playbook. They knew what they were doing. They knew how to manipulate people. They knew who they, who they could manipulate. And they were turning people against one another. Now, they had limited success with their indoctrination because, after all, they were using fear and intimidation with their tactics. And like I said, you can force people to do things and say things. You can't force people to believe things. Now, they were successful at convert, making converts out of a lot of people. Now, they thought they could target the black guys in particular because they figured the black guy, they have no, no love for America and they have nothing to lose. And beware of the man who has nothing to lose. Well, in fact, they, were, they did not have a lot of success with the black guys because they actually were more resistant to the indoctrination than the white guys. And the black guys actually had more camaraderie than the white guys did, and they had a higher survival rate to go with it. So it didn't always fit the profile. And it wasn't always just a matter of who had the most education or the least education either, because it's not really that simple. Like I said, <clears throat> the military and the mass media tried to break down, tried to make profile of the people that were compliant and the people that weren't. But it wasn't that simple. It wasn't just about education. It wasn't about race. It wasn't really about economic background. But you had people that were going along with the program just so they could stay alive. But it reminds me kind of of, of John 12, 25. Another verse that I think is relevant to this, John 12, 25 says, He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this age will keep it for eternity. Well, Staying alive is a big priority with a lot of people, but it shouldn't be their top priority with us. Now, this reminds me a lot of what was happening in Europe back in the, especially in the 16th century when the Reformation was going on and the Catholic Church was enforcing their own set of beliefs. And they were rigidly enforcing that, and the people that didn't go along with it were tortured and burned. And the people most... And <clears throat> Most of the people that were tortured recanted their beliefs. Of course, they weren't really changing their beliefs, but they were just going along with the program because they were trying to stay alive. And it's a very tough situation to be in, and I'm not going to try to say, I don't know what I would do in that situation. I wouldn't want to be in there. You wouldn't want to be in that situation either. And when I study history, I try to put myself in a situated situation of the people that I've studied, which makes it a little more real. But of course, we have not quite been in that situation, but try to think about what that's got to be like. It's a very, very tough spot to be in. So that's a question you're going to have to ask yourself. So at this point, questions or comments by anybody? Well, 
while everyone else is thinking about. It kind of reminds me of what's going on right now with uh, the media picking one side, the dividing of the people, the misinformation, the whole, I mean, Satan is definitely clever and well, subtle so, in many ways. Right. That's why we need, first of all, we need to use discernment. Now, there's, another, there's a couple, few more verses that I wanted to read that I think are relevant. There's uh, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. And a lot of these guys, uh, one of the reasons for the high attrition rate is because these guys were losing hope. A lot of these guys had given up hope of even, even coming home. A lot of these guys lost their will to live. Here's another thing, Proverbs 18, 4, the spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? Guy, there were guys that were simply, uh, they didn't want to live anymore. They stopped eating and they decided they wanted to die. That was one of the reasons why they had such a high attrition rate. But then again, staying alive is not really our number one priority. It's being faithful to God. Now also there's 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, like I said, the Chinese tactics were straight out of Satan's playbook. That's why I think these things we can learn from them. These men were being manipulated and they were living in, uh, <clears throat> in fear for their lives. And, uh, and sure enough, the Chinese were able to turn these guys into meat puppets. They you were able to use them for propaganda purposes. They got all these propaganda statements out of them. And here's another trick that they were using. They would say to these men, well, you were in favor of, do you want peace? You want the war to end? Well, sure. <clears throat> and they'd say, well, sign this petition for peace and join the peace committee. But what did they really mean by peace? Well, the way to achieve peace was by America giving up and withdrawing from Korea. Well, they could have achieved peace with the Chinese troops withdrawing from Korea, but they weren't going to do that because they wanted peace on their own terms, not our terms. Now, they would use that word peace. You want peace? Well, the way to peace is by, by the Chinese winning the war. Well, so Hitler it was a trick. Peace. Yeah. Hitler wanted a piece of Right, yeah. He wanted, peace, peace, he wanted a piece of everything. <laughs> yeah. You'll have peace when you surrender to us. Well, uh, I believe the Blizzard Ranch has got something to say. Oh, sorry. I was muting at my headset. But, um, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, Mark. Um, being in the trenches anonymously um, the censorship on Twitter and Facebook uh, has accelerated in the last ha uh, handful of months um, other things that I'm noticing unfortunately is those who claim to be conservatives are losing hope because they're allowing the media to gaslight them and to steal their joy so to speak um, which kind of reminds me, you know, um, you know, when Christ was saying that uh, he's going to suffer many things and so on and so forth, um, and then Peter, you know, rebukes him, and then Christ goes back to him and says, hey, get thee behind me, Satan, kind of thing, you know, because this stuff's got to happen. And it just is what it is. Um, but there are so many who are just just losing hope. And, and um, even those in our own tradition, so to speak, who are saying, oh, this is happening, and this is a sign of this, and this is happening, and this is a sign of this. You know, who who by worrying could, you know, add years to their life or, you know, whatever. I'm paraphrasing that horribly. Um, I, I'm not saying that uh, you shouldn't watch world events or see the things that are going on, but realize that there's, you know, God has this all in control. We know in the book of Revelation that we win. And, you know, granted, the journey may not um, 
uh, be easy for everyone. There'll be challenges along the way. But, uh, you know, that's, that's one of Satan's tools. You know, deceit, deception, depression, um, discouragement, you know, all the big D's, so to speak. And one of the things, and this is a tool that I, I hope I can offer to all of you, is when the media says something or there's some sort of sensationalist breaking news, um, implement the fudge rule. You know, 24 to 48 hours, usually the truth comes out. Um, I, I can give you so many examples where, you know, they've said this is going to happen or this has happened. And you know, like the Jesse Smollett thing, you know, which actually turned out to be, they, they said it was two white guys in MAGA hats that attacked this, this black actor. And, you know, 48 hours later, we find out he hired these two Nigerian dudes to attack him in order to create a fake race hoax. So my counsel to all of you is if the enemy can get you to be emotional and upset and to lose hope, that's how he wins. But just, you know, sit on it. 24 to 48 hours, the truth will come out. And unfortunately, some of the bigger mainstream media news organizations may post a retraction on, you know, page 48 <laughs> instead of, you know, saying um, like they did on the headline that, oh, this happened. Um, just, just give it, give it time. The truth will shake out. So that's my contribution. All right, now I also had a little more thing to say about what these men were being taught. Now let's turn it, let's, uh, can we turn on the, the syllabus? Oh, right. Yeah, right here. Yeah, I know, I got it. All right. First I got to open it, then we got to find it, then I got to share it. Okay, we'll open it. And I share it. All right, share. And then I got to get it to a size that's readable. Of course, it's not a very good scan. Yeah, too big. Yeah. Oh, why don't you, because it's so blurry. Okay. All right, well, I also wanted to talk a little bit about what these men were being taught. And I don't know if you can see it very well, but I'll just read it to you. This is just a basic syllabus. And a lot of what they were being taught was economics. And I wanted to go over a few things and economic principles in the Bible, which I think is relevant because like they were being taught about the communist ideology, which of course is wrong. Now there's only, I mean, people don't care about communism anymore. I think the cold war has been over for 30 years. And there's only five communist nations left in the world. Now, North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Cuba and China, although China is really not a communist nation anymore. They never officially renounced communism, but in effect, they're a capitalist nation. And they're going through a lot of the same kind of problems. Yeah, tell that to the people in Tiananmen Square a couple of years ago. Yeah, well. They're still a communist nation. Well, they're a dictatorship. Uh, president Xi has appointed himself president for life. It's, a, it's not a democracy, but now. This is a syllabus of what these men were being taught. First, there's the cause of the Korean War. First of all, these, they were being, the, the Chinese and North Koreans to this day insist that the South Koreans had started that war, and that's not true at all. Then they're explaining why the Chinese entered the war. They thought that America, well, first of all, there was a civil war going on in China. And America was supporting the anti-communist uh, led by Chiang Kai-shek. And they were afraid that we were going to invade China even though that was not part of the plan. Why the UN entered the war, they said that the US was there illegally. Then you get to the large rich families of the United States, DuPont, Morgan, Ford, Vanderbilt, Lodge, and Rockefeller. They did not mention Carnegie, but uh, yes. Uh, the, what we had, at least in the late 19th and early 20th century, when the Industrial Revolution was really kicking in, what you had was a huge gap between rich and poor, and it was a small number of very wealthy people. 
And uh, you had a very small middle class and everybody else was not really benefiting from the Industrial Revolution. In fact, there was hardly any middle class until the 1920s. And yes, that is a big problem with capitalism now. <clears throat> uh, what we have in the Bible is different because there was no banking system in ancient Israel. And without a banking system, the Industrial Revolution would have been impossible. You had an agrarian society where each person, each family was supposed to have their own piece of land, which would have made them self-employed and self-sufficient. Not only that, the land was not to be permanently sold. That is in Leviticus 25, 23. The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, and you are strangers and sojourners with me. Now, that's very important because... If people lose their, lose their land, they're going to have to work for somebody else. Now, what you had in Europe and in Asia for a long, long time was a feudal system where almost everybody was a serf, S-E-R-F. And that meant a serf, a, a dictionary definition of a serf was a slave that cannot be removed their, from their land. Almost all the wealth came from the land. So if you didn't own your own land, you had to work somebody else's land and you were, in effect, a slave. And it was a very unjust system. It was not according to the biblical system. Now, I can see why people weren't happy with it, and why they wanted to change it. But their solution to it was wrong. Because what they did in, in Russia and China and, and Vietnam and Korea and elsewhere was they killed the people that owned the land. And then they, they said there was no more private property. The government owns all the land. Well, they could have redistributed the land without killing the landowners, but I guess there was class, class war share warfare, and there were some grudges. And that's why they killed the people that owned the land. In Russia, they were called the Kulaks. <clears throat> they were the landowners. But, according to the Bible, each person was supposed to own their own land. It could not be sold permanently. Not only that, you could not charge interest. That is in Deuteronomy 23, 19 through 20. So let's just look at that. There's another important principle. You shall not charge interest to your brother interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest. To a foreigner you may charge interest, but to your brother you shall not charge interest that the Lord your God may bless you in all that you, that you say at your hand to do in the land which you are entering to possess. Now, that would preclude a so-called banking system. And to have a capitalist system, that means it requires capital, which is money which comes from money lenders who charge it at interest. If they don't charge interest, they're not going to lend any money. That's the whole idea. But if you follow the Bible principles, you're not going to have a banking system, which would preclude an industrial revolution. Now, I'm not saying that all technology and all industry is bad because there is a use and a misuse for everything, but what has technology brought us? Why did God divide the languages? the Tower of Babel. He was trying to slow down technological progress and if he didn't do that, we wouldn't be here right now because humanity would have destroyed itself. People think that technology is going to save us. It's not going to save us. It's going to destroy us. People have uh, nuclear weapons alone. Can wipe out all of humanity. It wasn't possible until the 1950s for humanity to literally destroy itself. And now we have biological weapons where people can wipe themselves out. And that's another big concern. And uh, <clears throat> no, technology is a, is a double-edged sword. It's the blessing and a cursing, and people cannot be trusted with too much technology. <clears throat> and, and here's another thing. Industry has, has caused a huge division in the, in the distribution of wealth. It's also caused environmental problems. It's caused a lot of air pollution, water pollution, and other forms of pollution. It's also created <clears throat> intense urbanization, which is another problem. Uh, Isaiah, it's, I think it's Isaiah 5, woe to him who joins house to house. Well, it's, it's not good for people to be too crowded together. It creates health hazards. It creates pollution problems, sanit sanitation problems. It also creates a fire hazard. It also raises the crime rate. And you're not going to have privacy. That's another reason why not good for people to be crowded together. And that's why 
the Industrial Revolution really has not benefited most people. And we're living in a house of cards right now. We become dependent on electricity. What if our power supply goes out? What's going to happen to us then? Our whole system's going to break down. Mark, can I interrupt for a second? That yeah, verse we said, join house to house. If you continue on, it says, until they're alone in the land. Mm -hmm. Okay. If God had a problem with cities, then he wouldn't be having a new Jerusalem. You know, he wouldn't provide for sanctuary cities for people to run to uh, in case of accidental death or whatever it may be. So I, I don't think inherently that he has a problem with cities. What he would have a problem with is how they're operated. Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, so, so on and so forth. So the concept of cities, there's nothing wrong with. It's just how man currently operates them. You know, I, I, I can give you a whole laundry list of the stuff that's going on in the city of Chicago or Detroit or, you know, any of these other sanctuary cities that are not biblical sanctuary cities, but uh, sanctuary cities for crime and, you know, illegal aliens. Um, totally different concept. But anyway, carry on. Well, I know that obviously Jerusalem is a city and there were other cities in Israel, but by our standards, they were just basically villages. They were nothing like Chicago or New York or Tokyo or London or something like that. Yeah, I don't, don't think they had apartment buildings that were yeah. 40 stories tall and you had a thousand people living in it. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not. I'm, oh, here's another thing. Here, here's one more verse that I want to cover. That's in Acts 2. Now, don't get me wrong here, but I'm just going to read what it says, starting in Acts 2.41. Those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. Hey, wait a minute! What does that sound like? It sounds like communism. They had all things in common. That's where the word communism comes from. The word common. Now. You could say that these were the original communists. But the thing is, all the communist nations are always atheistic, and they replaced God with the government. The government becomes their God. But if you see, the thing is, first of all, these people never had much to begin with. And they also had love for one another. <clears throat> and that's the key. Now, in these communist nations, these people don't have love for one another. And it's dog eat dog. But these people actually made it work, which I think is pretty interesting. I think it's worth noting. Any other comments out there? Thoughts? Rebuttals? It's uh, while people are gathered. Huh? Okay, not to play devil's advocate, so to speak, but... Um... Mr. History, the first colony with uh, Governor William Bradford, tried to practice uh, your concept, and they all had a belief in God, um, but we all know how that turned out, where uh, those who actually were working were very frustrated with those who, you know, hey, we don't have to work because we can always get our, you know, monthly or whatever distribution of food from the commissary and we don't have to work as hard. Mm -hmm. And if they hadn't uh, um, instituted private property and the ability to keep one's own profits, then that colony would have starved and um, been destroyed. Mm -hmm. That was in 1620, starting in 1620 when the pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock in November 1620 and they tried a communal living and it didn't work. And after, uh, three, after three years, they gave it up less than three years. Uh, can you hear me? We sure can. Go ahead. Okay. 
the explanation for what you read there in the book of Acts was it, it, it's a very simple explanation. And that is they expected Christ to come back immediately. So they were all just joining together and waiting for that uh, event to take place. And that eventually petered out because they re eventually realized that this wasn't going to happen. And so that was the reasoning behind that statement. Okay. That, yeah, good point. Yeah. Now you were on your way to Korea or you did you actually serve or you got there just before the amnesty? Mr. Roth. I was there uh, right after they signed the armistice. So I was there at a, probably an ideal time because it allowed me to see the ravages of war without suffering the penalty of war. And so it, it, uh, it, it was a really tough time, the, the, especially for the Korean people. They, a lot of them had to live in cardboard boxes for homes when they, but they were very industrious people, I can tell you that. Uh, they uh, came right back and started building homes. They, they had to build them with sticks and mud, but they did it and serviceable little homes that they built. And they started the farming up again and started things uh, moving along. So uh, it was a probably the best time. I think there, I think I was there because God wanted me to see what poverty, really poverty is. We, we talk about poor people in the United States. And let me tell you, poor people in the United States are like kings, would have been kings over there. So th this is uh, my observation. And uh, we lived uh, right, I lived right up on the DMZ. And we, I, we were the third line of defense that we were the ones that were supposed to hold if the Chinese came over. Of course, they never did. And uh, which was, as far as I'm concerned, very thankful. Well, South Korea to this day is thriving. And we stuck with them and they stuck with us and they're reaping the benefits of it. And uh, they are, like you said, very industrious people and they're very, uh, they take education very seriously. They're the hardest working students in the whole world. They're also a capitalist country. Yeah, yeah. Just saying. In fact, every country that has and, and capitalism doesn't necessarily include, you know, banking and interests and so on and so forth. I mean, the fact that, you know, I've not had any um, venture capitalists invest in my company, and yet it's providing profit. You know, it, it pays our bills and so on and so forth. So, um, in general, it's the model that helps lift the most number of people out of poverty. It creates a middle class. And unfortunately, there are, forgive the, the word, bastardizations of capitalism, where you have corporatism, uh, corporations that basically buy uh, legislative favor, uh, you know, laws that favor larger companies over smaller companies. I mean, I see that happening where um, a small company like mine has a hard time competing with larger companies in the industry that within which uh, Paul and I work. Um, you also see all sorts of other favoritism with the lawmakers and uh, kickbacks, you know, based on your campaign donation, so on and so forth, um, which almost starts to border on a fascist type model. Um, what's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily scribes and Pharisees. That's totally different. Yeah. Okay, buddy. Um, sorry, a little side conversation here with Paul. Um, but in general, you know, Mark, you noted that there's only a handful of communist countries on this earth, but there's a whole ton of socialist countries 
you know, that also include dictatorships to one extent or another. And a very frightening thing is to see uh, the, this current young generation seem to embrace that because they feel that that is the most fair, uh, it, it uh, um, provides the most opportunity, everything's free, so on and so forth. Um, but unfortunately, you know, no matter how much you try to explain to them that capitalism is about creating an equal playing field as best as possible, whereas socialism is trying to force an equal outcome, and that just doesn't work. Uh, I mean, you look at the parables of the Bible. You have a parable of the talents, right? You know, there are differing levels of ability there. You have um, the parable of the cities. You know, one guy gets five, another gets ten. It, there are differing levels of ability and gifts. That doesn't mean that, um, uh, that, that God's unfair. It's just he knows what the person's capable of. So the one who um, doubled his talents... You know, one guy had, uh, I, I'm, I, you're going to have to help me here because I, I can't um, recall. I think the one guy had one and he buried it. Another had two and another had five. But the one who had two and the one who had five, they both doubled it. That was the thing. They both doubled the investment that they had been given, whereas the other guy just buried it. You know, was the, uh, was the playing field equal? Well, yes, because they both had the same outcome. They both doubled it. You know, if that, if I'm making sense there. Um, but unfortunately, you know, I, I get really tired of hearing about, you know, I got to get a free college, free health care, free this, free that. And <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's not going to happen. And it's not free. Someone's got to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Someone's going to pay for it. And, but the thing that Mark really touched on about how the brainwashing, you know, this is, I think, where it ties in the whole thing of what's going on right now. Um, the enemy is trying to divide us on race, trying to divide us on class. You know, here we've got uh, 20 Democrats running for president, and it's probably going to boil down to some old white people, you know, the same ones that everyone's saying, oh, old, rich, white people, you know, they're horrible, yet they're going to be the ones that are running for president. Um, and the whole, you know, Bernie Sanders, oh, yes, income inequality, and he's got three houses, right? Um, I, I, I could go on with the hypocrisy, and it just amazes me. It amazes me that you see all these divisions on religion and, and wealth and, and race, what's that, hon? Oh, Paul reminded me the whole gender sexuality thing too. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't get me started. Um, it, it just It's just amazing that the same brainwashing techniques that the communists were putting on our own soldiers in Korea are now, you know, exponentially larger on a much just worldwide scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, We're done. I'd just like to make one, one comment about McCarthy, and that is that whatever he said, it really has come to pass because th that's, what we, that's what we have right now in the universities teaching and the schools teaching are a bunch of socialists or communists, depending on how, what, how deep they run. But that, that's what we ended up with. Just what he, unfortunately, his methods weren't the greatest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you were talking about MacArthur, MacArthur wanted to go into China. Yeah. <laughs> he why he knew the enemy. He wanted to wipe them out, and he was he he even proposed using the bomb, which was his undoing. Yeah, that's what got him fired. That's what got him fired. But I mean, he. He knew who the enemy was, and, and that's that is. I'm actually thinking about putting a putting a presentation together for um, from a, like a military point of view of enemy identification. Who are you really fighting against? Is it the the soldier, or is it 
the administration behind the soldier. You know, it, 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 we've lost focus of that. And, and as for, you know, you were saying the biggest thing you lost was hope. They lost us hope. We have the greatest hope there could ever be of actually get, living through this, getting through this, being resurrected, and actually being a part of the new government, of the healing, of the advancement of mankind in a peaceful manner, and the bringing of God's kingdom. You know, we are kind of like the subversives. We are the, the spies and whatnot ahead of time, setting the ground and getting the information. And that's the hope we have. And anyone has it, you know, I, I can't describe how many times I sat and we were discussing prophecy and this and that. And isn't this horrible? And I just kept saying, Christ cannot come with the United States in its present role. We have to be taken down. We, we, we got to keep in mind all the stuff that's got to happen. It's horrible. But I focus every day on this has got to happen. We, we, we just got to work through this and remember the goal. Keep your eyes on the goal. That's the kingdom. And losing focus of the goal, you lose hope. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And so again, fudge rule. Just something comes out, give it 24 to 48 hours, the truth will come out. There's no reason to get upset. Don't let them gaslight you. Um, you know, they'll do everything they can to discourage you. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the other thing is if our job is to be kings and priests, this is a very good, you know, if you really are paying attention to what is going on, um, all the things that I'm hearing that are going on in the background, you know, how um, foreign aid is being stolen and kicked back to politicians, I mean, it's just incredible. Oh, it's Oh, it's sick. Sure. It's just sickening, the stuff that's going on. And just thinking about, okay, we're going to basically be administrators in the kingdom of God. What better example to not follow <laughs> than, than what we are seeing played out at the moment? Um, because once everyone goes through this this tribulation we're going to be dealing with people who are shell-shocked we're going to be dealing with people who are who are going to say well why did god do this well uh because he needed to show you that your decisions and the choices that you have made this is the only outcome and not only that as administrators you know my people who I have put over you are not necessarily to uh, be slave drivers or whatever. They're to be counselors and teachers, you know, like in Isaiah, this is the way, walk ye in it. Um, a totally different way of approaching the governing of people, you know, like a, a child or a parent to a child kind of thing. And that they can trust us that, hey, you know, we can't be bribed. There'll be no kickbacks. <laughs> Um, I, I know, hon. right. Paul saying we'll also be teaching people who are, you know, Christians and so on and so forth. I, I got that part, but, uh, our churches of God, sure, sure. But, uh, it's, it's just an incredible contrast, um, to be able to say, hey, we've lived through this, we saw it happen in real time, and we know that that's definitely not the way to go. You know, not, not the way to govern, not the way to, uh, quote unquote, help people. Um, because if anything, you know, giving people free stuff stunts their growth, you know, completely ruins them as human beings. Um, it's kind of like when we pray to God for certain things, you know, they, sometimes the answer is no, because it, it may be something that you really, really want, but it's not the right thing at the right time, or, or it may not be the right thing at all, because it stunts your growth, and, um, you know, you're trying to treat God as an ATM instead of an actual, having a relationship with him, you know, so... 
I see Mike's mic is unmuted. Oh, hi. Yeah, this is Mike, and I, I did have a question. Thanks, Mark, for the presentation. Uh, definitely thought-provoking, and uh, to me, the Korean conflict was always like a prime example of Hegelian psychology. It, had you uh, looked at it from that perspective? What kind of psychology? Hegelian psychology. Oh, well, I never Hegel's thought of dialectic. I've heard of Hegel. Uh, well, what do you mean by that? Okay, well, let me, uh, uh, I'll just read a paragraph or two. Uh, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel was a German philosopher who revolutionized European thinking, especially Marxism. Hegel developed the concept of integrating and uniting a set of contradictions without eliminating or reducing either one to create a synthesis. This concept was often called dialectic thinking. So uh, Hegelian dialectic thinking is applied in many situations in world politics, often using the ordinary people as pawns in the game of Hegelian psychology played by those who pull the strings of world control. In other words, the political left and right are pitted against each other in order to achieve a synthesis that suits those in the hidden positions of world power. In the United States, for example, the right side was in power until several aims were accomplished, such as the war on Iraq and the war on terror. Then when all that could be done by that side was accomplished, the left came into power claiming to bring about change. However, the change only continued wars in Iraq and elsewhere and brought in additional social reforms that were further limited, that further limited the freedom of the American people. This pitting of one side against each other is a form of controlled conflict that those behind the scenes used to create a predetermined history. And uh, so the, the, the basic idea you know, like with Korea, is that you let one side of Korea be communism and you let the other side be capitalism with the purpose of the controlled conflict uh, to create a, some sort of a, a, a synthesis which both, uh, you know, uh, come to a compromise and agree to and so the, the setup after World War II was to purposefully create, you know, communist nations and, and capitalist nations and take them through the psychology of social change until they're ready to, uh, for the synthesis, which would be, say, intended as uh, democratic socialism, for example. Uh, were had you uh, you were probably taught that in, in like in high school that was what was going on in the world right? <laughs> well, I can't really remember. That was uh, during the Cola Wars. Uh, when the Cold War, yeah. The Cola Wars between Coke and Pepsi, but uh, <laughs> the Cola. <laughs> but uh, no, I don't remember that. But uh, yeah, the Cold War was still a big deal in the 80s and now people don't care about it. But back in the 50s, being a communist was like the next best thing to being a Satan worshiper. People were really paranoid. But, well, uh, the, see, the whole thing was predetermined. In other words, uh, the, the same people uh, conquered Russia and you know, killed the Tsar. Uh, killed all the Orthodox Christians in hope of bringing in a new world order to Russia. And then, but now the reason Russia is so demonized now is they went right back to uh, being Orthodox Christians and they're walling themselves off from the world because they realized what, what, they, what was happening is that they were being domineered by foreign nations 
you know, the communism was not a Russian creation. It was a German creation by Karl Marx. And uh, so I, I kind of think that's what's throwing the, 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 you know, you might say the ruling powers off is they never expected Russia to go back to being Orthodox Christian. They, they were supposed to follow through with the Hegelian dialectic and fold into the new world, one world government. Yeah, I was stunned when, uh, when they went uh, Orthodox. I mean, I never, I never saw that one coming. In fact, I didn't even know about that until you told me about that. This is like 10 years ago. But uh, that is a stunning turn of events. <clears throat> so now the socialists are Russian haters. <laughs> yeah, okay, well. It, it's obvious, right? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah that's a stunning turn of events right there, is that uh, they were the first communist nation and they were the first really atheistic nation. Now they're not communists and they're not atheist anymore. Go figure. And they're not tied into the new world order. In other yeah. words, they didn't follow the, they, they totally threw off their brainwashing. Well, now they're oligarch and thug run, but hey, whatever. Well, that's what the Russian Orthodox empire always was. It always was an oligarchy it, it was a theocracy, and that's what Putin is determined is to get it back to being a theocracy, not a democracy. They view democracy as evil. Well, it is. You know, it's two <laughs> it's two wolves and a lamb deciding what's you know voting on what's for dinner. <laughs> I mean, it, when I get into stupid online arguments with people who are so dumb who say, hey, we're a democracy. I'm like, no, we're a representative republic. A republic, yeah. And, you know, they, they so badly want to uh, dismantle the, uh, the electoral college. I mean, just <sighs> in general, the chatter amongst all the folks with which I interact is the battle right now. It's a spiritual battle. But the battle is for freedom versus, you know, totalitarianism, you know, or whatever, dictatorships, whatnot. Um, and, you know, every country has some mixture of that, you know, whether it's Sweden or, you know, the United Kingdom, even our country. Uh, right now there's a battle in Virginia over gun rights and you know everyone's bemoaning oh they're going to take away our guns and so I said okay uh, why did you have 15 Democrats run unopposed I mean if you were so worried about your rights that are guaranteed by the Constitution and by God why didn't you do anything about it you know and then it's crickets Well, the, see, and, and Karl Marx posed capitalism as thesis and communism as in, antithesis. So the whole thing of capitalism, like the Cold War versus communism, it's all Marxism. And what we're having now is people saying they don't want to have any of that whole thing. We want to keep our constitution. We want to keep our republic. We don't want to become a, a one world government. Well, was, I repeated something on Facebook I saw. It, said, it was a meme that said, you can vote in communism, but you have to shoot your way out. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I posted that on Twitter, only I use the word socialism. You can vote for... Well, actually, the difference between communism and socialism is communism is implemented by force and armies, et cetera, et cetera. Socialism, people voted in. Okay, so, yeah. so basically, you've got to shoot your way out. Right. So, hey, you can vote for socialism, but you've got to shoot your way out. <laughs> well, well, I was wondering how that fits in with, you know, the, the brainwashing uh, in the 
prisoner of war camps, you know, it kind of sounds like what the United States has been subjected through, through our uh, educational system. And, you know, that like the kids in school are, are brainwashed uh, to become socialists. And, and did you see any parallel between the uh, brainwashing of the prisoners of war and, and brainwashing of the public schools? It works. <laughs> well, the, the only difference, Mike, is that um, the kids aren't getting it 24-7 <laughs> from the schools. They're only getting it five days a week. Uh, but they're getting the rest of it from the mainstream media when they go home. Yeah, yeah. So oh. it, it was working here, you know, even though we were the, the other side of the dialectic, we were being drawn in to, you know, we were being brainwashed too, put it that way. But uh, again, and I, I don't defend Trump from the standpoint of, do I agree with the way that he handles things or, or the way he conducts himself or talks? Not necessarily, but again, you know, I didn't vote for him to be my pastor or my rabbi. You know, it's like when you vote for a garbage man to take out the trash, you, you just basically let him do what he needs to do to take out the trash. Um, some of the things that are going on in the background that have been revealed slowly in terms of the spying on him and um, essentially the, the stuff that's gone on, which is a hundred times worse than Watergate, um, leads me to believe that God and in his infinite mercy has chosen to give us some breathing space. Does that mean that you know, the tribulation and all the other things that we've been told are going to happen to this country is on hold, you know, permanently? No. Um, but just like, you know, Hezekiah, when he was told, hey, put your affairs in order, and then he wept bitterly, you know, saying, hey, I've done everything you wanted me to do, God, and then the prophet came back and said, okay, you've been given a reprieve. I, I really and truly believe that God hears his saints when we pray and that this was a wake-up call because we not only needed to um, learn what a bad government looks like but we also needed to be able to learn how to communicate what we see going on to our fellow citizens whether they be in the church or not um, because they're just some folks that and I get it. They don't want to deal with the stress and, and hear about these horrible things that are going on in the background. But, you know, this is this is reality. Um, it, you know, I, I am very grateful to Yahweh for the break. And that's all that I'm going to say about that. Uh, there is one thing that uh, I'd like to remind everyone is the fact that historically all republics degenerate into a dictatorship. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, when the citizenry can vote itself breads and circuses from the treasury, that's when the republic falls. I know I'm bastardizing uh, Franklin's quote, but um, that's essentially where our, we where we are at, and we we see that now. And you know the the logic, it's it's there. Uh, you know here in the state of Illinois, now everyone's uh, buying recreational marijuana. But hey, what they don't know is um, when you fill out a form to buy a gun, and you say no to marijuana use, um, and you use marijuana, it's a felony. So it's a stealth way to get people's guns. And, you know, no one uses logic. Oh, yeah. I know, Mark, you're giving me that what? <laughs> that what look? Well, I, I, uh, I <laughs> didn't ever thought of it that way. But, uh... Yeah, when you fill out the, the background check form, when you're buying a gun, it says, do you use marijuana? It doesn't matter if, it, if you 
use it for medical or recreational? Right. Well, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Lying on a federal form is a felony. Yep. Yeah. So what, what if you don't have a gun or use marijuana? <laughs> Well, then that's don't go don't, don't go anywhere where it says you can't have a gun. I don't <laughs> you're sitting duck. <laughs> uh, so so wait a minute, let me get this straight. If somebody owns a gun and they use marijuana in Illinois, that's a federal crime? Or what? Technically, yeah. Okay. Well, if you already own the gun and you're using it now. I, I don't think there's anything you can do. They they can do, but when you go and um, and they and the dispensary says they're not going to share the information with uh, uh, you know the sheriff's department or the state, but and they don't. They don't openly share it. It's stolen via <laughs> <laughs> intelligence through you know it's stuff. Oh, we're storing, where are we storing? Oh, we're storing it on the cloud. <laughs> right. There's more people looking at that cloud than you. Anyway. I don't know. We, we just lost somebody else. Yep. On the uh, broadcast. I'm probably like five. <sighs> Anyhow. Um, any other comments before we go into fellowship mode? Oh, I thought we were in fellowship mode. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> okay. Well, then I will stop the recording if we're in fellowship mode. Be right back. I want to stop. Yes, I want to stop the cloud recording.